You're tuned to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis, and today's debate is on Venezuela. The country's leader, Hugo Chavez, this week won a fourth term of office, greeting his re-election as what he termed a perfect victory. Tens of thousands of his supporters thronged the streets in Caracas to celebrate that win. But in contrast to previous polls, this time it was relatively close. Mr Chavez won just under 55% of the vote. His challenger, Enrique Capriles, won almost 45%. The president has vowed to continue Venezuela's march towards democratic socialism, but has also said he'll work with the opposition. But his room for manoeuvre might be limited. Venezuela's debt has shot up since Chavez first took office in 1999 and now stands at over 50% of GDP. So will Mr Chavez be able to press ahead? Or will he be forced to come to terms with the fact that almost half the electorate wanted a different president? I'm joined now by Alvira Sanchez, Deputy Ambassador at the Embassy of Venezuela in London, Matt Ince, an analyst at the Royal United Services Institute, and by Lee Salter, a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of the West of England. And if I might start with you, Deputy Ambassador, in this case we do have almost half the electorate going for a different person this time, unlike previous elections where Mr Chavez won an overwhelming majority. Does that mean he'll have to compromise some of his policies? Well, Mr Davies, allow me to disagree with you. He won with a vast majority of the population. Uh, it was not a close race, race, as you stated in your introduction. We're talking about 12-point lead. Let me tell you, that's a landslide by whatever political standards you want to, to utilize. That's much more than what Obama got in his first election in 2008, much more double what Obama got in his first uh, election in 2008, and yet the whole world agreed that Obama won by a landslide uh, at that time. So, so it was at a vast majority. We're talking about 12 points. We're talking about 1.5 million voters ahead of the opponent in a country where uh, uh, only 19 million voters were, were registered uh, uh, to vote. So, so it was a, a, a meaningful majority and advantage by President Chavez. I don't think anyone's arguing that he won a, won a sort of substantial majority, but it has been in contrast to previous votes. Um, it's substantially cut into this time, surely. But not by much. If you if you want to even look at previous elections, it has been a, 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 a still a meaningful margin of of a victory. Now, even if you uh, analyze those results uh, compared to other politicians in the world, for a president who has been democratically elected for so many years, uh, uh, it's normal for any politician at that rate that it's uh, uh, his or her own popularity will decrease. That's common and normal in any uh, political circumstances. And yet, what we see in Venezuela is the opposite. We see a president that since he got to power in 1998 until now, 13 years afterwards, his popularity remains more or less the same. He's vastly popular. Now, the reason why is not what the media tells you here. If you read all the newspapers, the media here in Britain, but also worldwide, it was an international campaign against Chavez. You will imagine that uh, Venezuela was in complete shambles, that it does a dictatorship, that the economy is falling. By the way, you also said that 50% of the GDP in debt is actually less than that. It's even less than 30%. But anyway, uh, 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 the, the, the idea, the, the, the message conveyed by the media here in Britain was that, uh, uh, is that Venezuela well, it's absolute chaos. Yet, 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 what Chavez has done from since 1998 until now was reduce poverty in half, uh, uh, quadruple the number of pensioners in Venezuela, triple the number of university students, provide free health care and education for the total uh, population in Venezuela. Now, that's what people see, and this is why he keeps getting re-elected. He's absolutely popular, and he won landslide. Martin, so I might go to you for a second. Were there any worries about this poll being held as a free and fair one? It seems to be that most analysts say, well, look, it, there may have been some irregularities, but in general, free and fair. Would you agree with that analysis? I mean, yes. Um, I'd say that this certainly is testimony to the fact that Venezuela is able to hold free and fair elections on the election day. Um, there's perhaps a lack of transparency in the campaign itself. I mean, I, I think that no one would dispute the fact that the lead ruling party in Venezuela readily uses state resources to be able to fund the, the campaigns of its party and at the same time also has a monopoly over national media output. So there's automatic advantages that it will always have over any opposition trying to stand against it. At the same time, though, I think this is an enormous uh, public relations victory for Venezuela's democratic um, credentials. And clearly, um, 
President Chavez has demonstrated once again that the majority of Venezuelans still consider him to be the man for the job, despite some shortcomings that he may have. Lee Salter, we talked a little bit about sort of the Western perceptions of, or Western media perceptions of Chavez. Do you think there is just this, this demonization of him in the Western media? I mean, I've been looking at British news coverage, including the BBC and most major newspapers, for the past five or six years. We looked at ten years of BBC reporting and so on. And I think the crucial thing to understand about how Venezuela is misrepresented is not these kind of tirades you might expect against Chavez, although they do exist, there's not many of them. It's the ordinary reporting of other things in which there's the odd reference to Venezuela. There was a fascinating article, I think it was in the Times, when um, the Venezuelan government decided to repatriate gold, um, which I think, given the state of European economies, was quite a reasonable move. It was to do with the stabilisation of the Venezuelan economy and also regional policy to um, gain greater independence for Latin American economies. It was reported speculated in the times that the reason Chavez himself had decided to do it was because he was expecting international sanctions as a result of violence during the elections because he would be defeated and refuse to stand down and this is normal this is absolutely normal every single thing that happens in Venezuela is imputed to frankly ridiculous reasons and, and this inadequacy of, of the British media is is a great concern because people just don't really understand what's going on. That's not to say everything's wonderful in Venezuela all of the time. I was going to say because I think it's, it's hard to deny though I'm sure the deputy ambassador will that there are certain authoritarian tendencies within the Chavez government which for example his use of the media during this election. I think we need to be really careful with how we regard the Venezuelan media. I'm not very comfortable telling another country and another population, a former colony of Spain, how to do things. Especially when in this country over the past few days, we've just seen someone imprisoned for wearing a T-shirt. We've seen someone imprisoned for commenting on the death of a baby. We saw uh, a couple of lads a couple of uh, a year ago in prison for four years for writing stuff on Facebook during a riot. We're not in the best position to, to tell everyone else what to do. But you have to bear in mind what the Venezuelan private media have been. They've not been an independent, free media over the past 10 years, in the slightest. They've lobbied wholeheartedly on the part of reactionaries whose prime objective is to overthrow Venezuela's uh, democracy. Uh, it's not the true, true that Chavez has got a, a monopoly over national media in the slightest. I mean, there is a... a, a thriving media sector what's happened but to be to be fair he has closed down the most popular tv station there because it was uh, against him i don't think it's because it was against him i mean if in this country bbc itv all of the major news channels are held to a license as overseen by ofcom okay if they do the wrong thing if they do something against their guidelines chances are their licenses won't be renewed if ITV were to come out and make a direct plea to British military commanders to overthrow David Cameron, and then the army actually did that, they would lose their licence. Chavez didn't move against them after they did that for something like five years. And I think, Alvaro know more than I do, I think it was on the basis of issues to do with the way they were running the business, not non-payment of taxes and so on. So they went on to another platform rather than the national media. Now, now... At the same time, I'll just say, when I was out there and I had to, you know, and I listened to Chavez talking for four hours, I didn't particularly like it, OK? But then I'm not going to tell them what to do with their media. Alvaro, there have been problems with uh, privately owned media before and there have been stations closed down. Look, uh, the, the first thing I would like to say is that still now, 80% of media in Venezuela belongs to the private sector. Only 20% is, is state-controlled. So uh, uh, we're talking about a huge disadvantage, but on the side of the opposition, not on the side of, of, the, of the government. Now, the bottom line, I think we need to... to, to and let me, let me go back to what I said at the beginning, uh, uh, because I've, I've heard this uh, a few other times, but people criticizing the, the victory of President Chavez, that, uh, well, because of so much media that was put into the campaign a few months before, they were able to convince people to vote for him. As, 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 well, as, the president did have, did have four-hour-long programs about himself, and the opposition had the three minutes a day. There is a dichotomy there, no? Again, they have 80% of the media. 
they have plenty of means to let other people come in. And, 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 and not to mention international media, who is fully in support of, of, of the other guy. But listen, look, the bottom line is that I think that attitude is patronizing. Uh, against uh, the Venezuelan people. We cannot treat Venezuelan people as stupid people who just go and because they put a couple of advertisements on television or radio, they'll go and forget about well, how... A couple of the, the, four hours. The, the bottom line is that people know what Chavez has done for them. We're talking about a president who, ha who has been able to cut poverty in more than half. Okay? That, by, that by itself should be able to win him any, any kind of political context, context he will have in the future. And all the wonderful social achievements that Venezuela has been able to 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 conquer in this past uh, uh, 13 years that that's the the bottom line that's what matters and this is why people repeatedly go to the polls and keep reelecting Chavez uh, the minute Chavez will stop doing this then that's the minute that he will lose not because other arguments that many people are trying to convey here you're tuned to The Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today's debate is on Venezuela, where Hugo Chavez has just won a fourth term of office as president. I'm joined in the studio by Alviro Sanchez, Deputy Ambassador at the Venezuelan Embassy in London, Matt Ince, an analyst at the Royal United Services Institute, and by Lee Salter, a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of the West of England. Matt Ince, it's indisputable that Chavez is popular with, with a large, a very large section of the Venezuelan public, isn't it? I mean, the results have clearly showed that, and what's even more of a testament to that is the, the sheer amount of people that actually came out to vote on the day. I mean, just over 80%. If you compare that to what we'd have in a general election here in the UK, that's in incredible. What's more, if you look at the uh, upcoming police and crime commissioner elections we're going to have here in November, where it's estimated that only about 18% of the general population are going to come, come out and vote, I think, yeah, I mean, Chavez clearly does resonate well with uh, the majority of voters in Venezuela, and there's certainly a, a lot of good reasons for that. Um, you list off a lot of the things that he's achieved since being in office, and I, I, I wouldn't take away from that at all. But that's not to say that he doesn't have a lot of challenges that still have to be overcome, or the fact that the opposition perhaps builds upon some of the success that he's had over the last years and offers an alternative future political path for Venezuela to take in the, in the future. I think, I think on that question of, of support, it's also worth mentioning, mentioning that, yes, the, the percentage of um, support has gone down a little, still massively popular but as far as i understand the actual some vote has gone up year on year on year so this was actually the largest vote that he had achieved so far in terms of economics where does you see the future challenges for venezuela there is no question that there are issues and in, in, in the economic ar arena uh, is one for example inflation is a major problem in venezuela but i think as long as in venezuela president chavez uh, uh, is committed to continue and maintain social spending at, at, at levels uh, uh, seen before. There are no uh, uh, talks about uh, spending cuts or social spending cuts or nothing like that. And we are confident that as long as him or any other government, by the way, who maintains that type of proposal, there is no way that the country will go wrong. It's, it's as simple as that. Well, there is one way the country could go wrong. If the oil price declines, surely you might be in, in deep trouble then. Well, uh, there are many alternatives to that. First of all, the Venezuelan proven reserves of oil, good for Venezuela for approximately the next 300, 400 years. But in addition to that, we have other lines of credit in addition to the ones that put us into major trouble in, in the 18, 1980s and 1990s, namely the FM, IMF and the World Bank. We have China, for example, that will not touch so many strings to us. And, and we have a clean, reliable, political kind of credit that we can actually uh, get access to. And, and this, is, this is good. This is a good political economic ally, a wonderful, a great uh, political ally that we have in, in China. But that will be the worst case scenario. If things continue as they are continue, as they are right, as they are right now, we are seeing that Venezuela for the past few years is actually growing the economy uh, is moving ahead, uh, not as fast as probably many people will want, but it's moving ahead in spite of the financial... So it's growing, I think, at the moment, about sort of 5% annually, I think. Is yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, do you think this is a, a plausible argument that it will carry on growing at not, not a vast China-type rate of growth, but at a healthy rate at the moment? I mean, I think so, yes. I mean, I think obviously inflation is a concern at rates of nearly 20%. Obviously, this is going to be a key issue that Chavez is going to have to tackle, um, despite continued 
growth fueled by oil revenue. I mean, a lot of this, which then gets sold off to uh, other ALBA countries at subsidised rates, um, and a lot of obviously gets fueled into a lot of social welfare programmes within Venezuela, has meant that economically it's not perhaps in the situation that it could be given the amount of oil reserves that it has. That said, I think that the economy is just one of a number of challenges that Chavez will have to look at, insecurity probably being at the top of the list. I mean, the murder rate in Venezuela is one of the highest in the world. Um, crime affects people at every level of society. Um, these are issues which perhaps on the campaign trail Caprilla has managed to kind of almost champion. In, and so if Chavez is going to almost regain back some of the votes that he potentially lost, he's going to have to get on top of these issues. But then as well, and not least to say that the fact that Chavez's ill health or the secrecy surrounding it is, is likely to remain high on the political agenda as well. I mean, I think that, as you probably know, the Venezuelan constitution says that if he was to become in, unable to rule within the first four years in office, there would have to be an, an, another election held within 30 days. A lot of the issues that we've seen in the build-up to this election um, relating to the potential outbreak of violence or um, the fact that um, political crisis could unfold potentially in Venezuela means that these issues are still perhaps in play should something happen. Dr Salter, you said you've, you've come back not that long ago from Venezuela. Was there a feeling of unease on the streets? It was not that recently, but, the, you know, there's always a sense of unease on the street among the wealthy, um, who, if you speak any English, you know, flock to you to tell you how Chavez is evil because he puts... Um, <laughs> the best one I heard was... Uh, tiny weeny little cameras into light bulbs so he can see what everyone's doing in their house and you know so you there's a level of paranoia there yeah. of, of absurdity i think yeah absolutely but in terms of of you know the, you, you, this initial point about what's going to happen with the economy i think one of the really important things to do when we look at venezuela is not just to use say the world bank's ways of, of, of thinking of the of, of economics i mean one of the things that they well yeah, as, as the deputy ambassador pointed out even by the world bank's way of, of, of doing things it's still growing at five Ab percent absolutely yeah. but the other important thing about venezuela is the big push the big driver ever since 1999 is to get communities to develop themselves it's called endogenous development so they want to move them away from oil dependency at a local level now the problem that venezuela faces or at least the problem the the, the government faces is the capacity of people in the communities to do that some projects have worked really well some projects haven't worked so well um things you know when i was there and i was kind of asking about the barrios and i said why are there still all these barrios what's happening and the answer from everybody was well it's not our job as the government to come in and knock them down and build 1960 style sink estates it's up for them and we'll provide the resources to help them develop and one of the <coughs> things was in a number of the barrios the communities are very well developed very well established and they don't want to be moved on elsewhere so an extraordinary growth in healthcare is one, the one thing people often point out absolutely absolutely and i think it's these measures as well that, that fit into a, a way of looking at economics that isn't classical or, or, or traditional but actually can, can tell us a lot about the health of venezuela as a country is there also a feeling that perhaps the country is too over-reliant on the one export of oil if it's going to fund this local development, it is perilously reliant on oil. Though. Well, as is every great Des oil. Despite the, perhaps the offer of credit from China. Sure. I mean, it's a really strange question, though, because um, number one, you know, an absolute realisation right at the beginning was we're over dependent on oil. OK, so that's been, again, a number one policy to move. But it remains dependent on oil, doesn't it? But then the second part of the, of the answer is if you've got the biggest, you know, some of the biggest oil reserves in the country, do you not depend on them? Do you not use them to fund social programmes? I think it's quite wonderful that at the moment they've got the resources to invest in healthcare and education and literacy and works programmes. Because what we've got in this country is a dependence in, on oil, but the profits go out of the country. The profits don't get used for social projects for the poorest and so on and so forth. So, you know, long live the dependency. If well, that's what the result is. To be fair, the British it. government might argue that it spends 60 billion on, on welfare payments here, which is, you know. A fairly large chunk of change, I'd say. I'd just like to, the, the Deputy Ambassador to tell us a little bit about this very, very local development. What is the government trying to do by working in, in the barriers we're talking about here? How is it different from most sort of top-down development? Well, the, the, the first thing is, is the, the level of empowerment to, to women. That's, that, that's probably the first thing that, is, that strikes my mind. And anyone who will go to Venezuela will notice that Im immediately. How many uh, women who in the past did not have that level of political opportunities, now you see them at, at grassroots level 
organizing their communities and, and, and making progress for their neighborhoods. Uh, uh, in the constitution of Venezuela, and uh, the, 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 the concept of uh, uh, communal uh, uh, governments and participation is enshrined and therefore the, the people have that uh, opportunity to participate constantly and to take uh, the controls in, 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 their own, in their own hand. You're tuned to the Voice of Russia. I'm Howell Davis. And today's debate is on Venezuela, where Hugo Chavez has just won a fourth term of office as president. I'm joined in the studio by Alviro Sanchez, Deputy Ambassador at the Venezuelan Embassy in London, Matt Ince, an analyst at the Royal United Services Institute, and by Lee Salter, a senior lecturer in journalism at the University of the West of England. Matt Ince, one does hear reports, and as, as you have said, that the media sometimes is slightly slanted to, uh, against Venezuela, that sometimes this local development is very much geared towards helping the, the governing party. Have you come across much evidence of that? I mean, to be honest, no, I haven't. Um but from what you read and whether that's a tainted opinion in the Western media, um, that, that is the driving force behind a lot of these sort of policies is to genuinely try and help and boost development within local communities and from the grassroots build up a society that values itself and can develop. But is the government perhaps too dependent on, on one figure in charge, Hugo Chavez? What happens, and as we know, he's been very, very sick recently. What do we, what do we think would happen if he had to, I don't know, step down or die, do you think? I mean, I think it would certainly leave a power vacuum um, within the, lead, the ruling party. I think that there would then be the potential for um, at least a, a power play to take place. There's no clear succession mechanism in place within um, um, at the moment in Venezuela. And I think that there are a lot of people whose interests would not be served by changes to the status quo. Um, not least within the Venezuelan military, a lot of senior ranking officers perhaps owe their, their current position within the, the administration to the, um, the, the Bolivarian Revolution. Also, there's a lot of armed, politicized um, civil movements within Venezuela, such as the, the colectivos and the, um, the Bolivarian militias, who similarly might take to the streets or be used by politicians to stoke violence should a, a new election have to take place within 30 days of any incident um, and and the result not not be desirable to them. So putting to you Deputy Ambassador that perhaps the revolution is the Bolivarian revolution is perhaps too much dependent on, on Hugo Chavez. How would you respond to that? Yeah, let, let me first uh, come back to, to your point. By recent history, the, the only people who have created major trouble in Venezuela disturbing, uh, trying to collapse the country economically, uh, helping in a coup d'etat, and creating all type of, uh, types of violence is the Venezuelan opposition. It's proven, it's there, it's history. Well, Hugo so, Chavez himself so, has led a coup, hasn't he? An attempted coup in the past. Well, by, by which anyone or some people may or may not may agree. But you're referring to 2002, but, which was... Which is, uh, yeah, which is fairly recent, and we saw how, how it, it took place, and it was the opposition who are now saying exactly the same argument that you just uh, um, explained here, that, oh, what if, and then, therefore, all the people who support Chavez are going to come to the streets and, and, and create complete chaos. Is exactly what they did, and and they don't have uh, any recent reference to to say, look, they have done this in the past. In fact, the the uh, recent elections, not all elections have been won by by Chavez. He, for example, we lost the 2007 referendum. There was no chaos in on this in the streets. Many governorships have been lost, mayorships, even uh, Capriles uh, uh, won the governorship of the state of Miranda, and there was no chaos. I mean, people who support uh, the Bolivarian Revolution so far have uh, shown that they fully respect the democratic uh, rules and, 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 and that's how it has been. One of the major challenges that Chavez faces is um, finding, and you know, they've been doing this for the past few years, trying to create structures of, you know, developing a party and so on. But one of the reasons that hasn't happened is because the Bolivarian movement grew out of these, these small communities in the barrios and so on and so forth. A lot of the structures they're using are organic if you like you know from these but it's certainly a problem you know if if you create a movement too much around a single person you're dependent on the health and sanity of that particular person and i think it's something that that must be addressed is there also a deputy buster like to be any change in the next four years we've had a uh, domestic policy you're saying that uh, things are going to stay the same but in terms of international policy policy towards other nations look i'm really in no position to to say that but what i can tell you is something that uh, many, many people are uh, 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 driving force of the Chavista vote in Venezuela was to continue 
with the, the, the bit of Venezuelan foreign policy uh, for Latin American integration, which has been absolutely successful. Uh, we have yet to see much of Latin America being integrated. Though, no, no. <laughs> let, let me tell you, well, we have many, many schemes in place. Alba, to mention one, which again has been very successful and very beneficial to poor communities around in the continent, not just in Venezuela. We're talking about Petro Caribe, which provides subsidized oil to uh, small yes, islands. Sorry, yes, yes. We're talking about Telesur, that, that actually provides a picture of, of who we are instead of just uh, depending on, on international broadcasters telling us what we need to think about and so on. Uh, we're talking about the Bank of the South. There are many, many other uh, uh, schemes that, because of this type of progressive governments in place, is that now we're seeing a, a progressive coalition that uh, is benefiting uh, the majorities of the population in the region. Dr. Salter, is there much fellow feeling among all these other nations? These sound like sort of extremely valuable um, initiatives, but is there a sort of a, a feeling of wanting to give up uh, sovereignty on a, on a wider scale? than these programs, do you think, in Latin America? Well, I think that, you know, obviously that Chavez has got a lot of allies. It's another media myth, actually. One of the things that we found looking particularly at the press is, I think we looked at a year's worth of the main newspapers, and then again and again and again, they report Chavez is isolated, his only ally is Ahmadinejad in Iran every single time. Chavez has got lots of allies around South America. They're mutually supportive in Argentina, in uh, Brazil, in Ecuador, all, all over the place. Bolivia. Um, and Bolivia too, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's a very... It's a majority of the population of, South, of Latin America. Absolutely, <laughs> by a long way. And, and I think one of the reasons for that is precisely because in fact, this idea of endogenous development was a UN idea from the 1960s, and, and it's been already successful in Brazil and other places. So this isn't Chavez imposing something on the rest of Latin America. This is a, a, a long tradition of, if you like, anti-imperialist or independence movements and their economic formations and political formations. So, yeah, I think there's a, a great deal of support for it. And something which I think as well, which we're likely to probably see over the coming years, is the strengthening of relations between Venezuela and Colombia. I mean, over the last two years since uh, President Santos came into power, the, the relations have really pulled back from the diplomatic low which they perhaps reached under President Uribe in Colombia. And now the Venezuela is playing a key role in the peace negotiations that are just about to take place in Norway between the Colombian government and the FARC, the region's most prominent left-wing guerrilla insurgency. I think that certainly they will look to strengthen um, relations in the future, which if you take the argument that Chavez is uh, the region's chief anti-US antagonizer who builds relations with Iran, it's quite then in contrast to the fact that he's building relations with, with Colombia, who are probably the US's biggest ally within the region. Mm. So I, I think that in terms of foreign defense and security policy, whereas a lot of the, the norms will continue in the future in terms of the development of the Bolivarian revolution, I think there's also a lot of uncertainty and, and hopefully uh, we'll be work working towards facilitating a much more stable South America, Latin America, which I think is fundamentally what, or at least the impression that Hugo Chavez gives what he wants. I think this is also dependent on the outcome of the US elections as well. Yeah. I mean, if Romney gets in, not that Obama doesn't want to interfere, but I think, you know, Romney will be driven by some very scary forces in the US who will very consciously seek to undermine any sort of progress in that respect. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for. I would like to thank my guests, Alviro Sanchez, Deputy Ambassador at the Venezuelan Embassy in London. Matt Ince, an analyst at the Royal United Services Institute, and Dr Lee Salter, Senior Lecturer in Journalism at the University of the West of England. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.